Welcome to the Digital Puritan, a new Puritan and Reformed digital audio source that aims to bring you solid digital audio recordings of the best of the Puritans and their successors from the past. Featuring narrations by Dwayne Lynn and Thomas Sullivan. To find more narrations, go to PuritanAudiobooks.net. The following sermon by Jonathan Edwards. It's called Persons Ought to Do What They Can for Their Salvation. Taken from Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. The first six verses of the chapter consist chiefly of reflections on man's mortality. As particularly that good and bad are alike in this respect. There is one event to all and that all must die, and wherein in the state of the living differs from the state, as in the opportunity and room for hope that the living have, that the dead have not, and that the dead have no more a reward in this world, that their love and their hatred and their envy are now perished, and that they have no more a portion forever in anything done under the sun. And then the wise men makes improvement of these reflections in the verse of the text, and three foregoing verses and advice that he gives in two particulars. The first is in the three verses preceding the text, which is to enjoy and take the comfort of the worldly good things which God gives us while we live, and not do as many do from a covetous spirit, deprive themselves of the good of what they enjoy and not use it for their own comfort. The other is in the verse of the text, i.e., with the utmost duty and speed to do that work that we must do before we die. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Here in this verse, first, the advice, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And secondly, the reason, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. It is the first part that I would now insist upon, namely, the words of the advice, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And they plainly imply two things. Number one, that we should do what we must do before we die with the utmost diligence. That we should use our utmost endeavors and lay out our utmost strength to get that work done. And number two, that it be done with the utmost possible speed. The wise man, when he says, do it with thy might, means that we should make the utmost haste, all the haste that possibly we can. This is evident by the reason that follows, that there is no work or device, nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Therefore the meaning must be to do it speedily, whilst you may do it. For the time is hastening when it can't be done. If you delay till death comes... Until you are in the grave, it will be too late. You can do nothing there. No device or contrivance will help you after you are dead. Therefore, the first doctrine I would raise from the words which I would insist on at this time is, Persons ought to do what they can for their salvation. To clear up this doctrine, I would first explain what is intended by persons doing what they can for their salvation, and secondly, show that there are some things that persons can do for their salvation. And number three, give the reasons why they ought to do what they can. The first thing I would do is to explain what is intended by persons doing what they can for their salvation. This may be clearly understood by the consideration of the following particulars. There are some things that are beyond the capacity of man's nature, that human faculties are not capable of. Thus it is above the capacity of a man's nature to comprehend God, or to create anything, or to raise the dead, to stop the sun in its course. It is beyond the capacity of man's nature to do many things that the angels can do. God has made them beings that excel in strength, and they are capable of some things that human nature is not capable of. There are many things that no improvement of those faculties that a man has will be sufficient They are beyond the nature of a man. As long as man is man, he can't do them. In order to do them, he must be something more than man. 
Such things as these are in no respect in man's power, and therefore such an impotency as this wholly excuses a man, frees him from any obligation. If a man has this to plead for, his not doing anything, that it is above the capacity of his nature, that he can't do it unless God should give him new faculties, this is a good excuse. It is impossible that man should be under obligation to do anything that is above the capacity of his nature, because his incapacity for it is from God. God never gave man faculties that should enable him to do it, but has created him so that he is incapable of it. Genesis 30, verse 1 and 2. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead, who has withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? And God never requires anything of man but what is commensurate to the faculties that he has given him. He never commands him to do anything above the capacity of the human nature. God doesn't require a man to do those things that he cannot do unless he should have the strength and capacity of an angel. But in everything, accommodates his commands to the capacity of the creature commanded. Number two, there are other things that are not above the capacity of man's nature that yet man in his fallen state cannot do without new principles, such as to know God, to love God, and believe in Christ, to exercise a gracious humility, to repent, to be submissive, exercise charity, or to perform any spiritual or gracious action. These things are none of them above the capacity of man's nature. There are some other beings whose natures are not capable of these things, as the brute creatures, but the nature of man is capable of them. They are commensurate to man's faculties. God gave man such faculties as he has on purpose that he might exercise them in those things. His faculty of understanding was given chiefly that he might know God and his faculty of will chiefly that he might love God and choose God. And therefore we must suppose his faculties are fitted to that end. Though things are no more above the capacity of the human nature than any action that a man performs. And yet man in his fallen state can't do them without new principles. He can do them without any new faculties, but not without new principles. Once man was in such a state that he could know God and love God, and the like without any other principles than he had, but now it is not so, because man by the fall has lost those principles that once he had. Therefore man in his present state may be said to be wholly impotent as to these things. He is dead to them and can't perform them whilst he remains in a natural state any more than a dead man can perform vital acts. But a man may be obliged to do those things that in this sense he is impotent to. Such an impotency as this does not excuse him as that upon two accounts. One is because his impotency is from himself and not from God. He brought it upon himself by his own sinful action that he committed when he was not impotent. God did not make man at first with this impotency. He gave him faculties that are naturally capable of those things, and not only so, but he furnished him with principles in which he might perform them, but he lost those principles by a fault that he committed when he was free and not impotent. And another reason is a corruption that renders man impotent is the inclination and will itself. It is not only in the understanding, but in the will. And it is by the will's being concerned in it that it became faulty. There is nothing that will excuse a man for a perverse will. For example, his not loving God, but hating him, is a thing seated in the will itself. If a man's will was good, and then was impotent, his impotency would excuse him. But when his impotency is in the perverseness of the will itself, that can't excuse him according to the common sense of mankind. What is willful is inexcusable. It may be truly said that if a man would receive Christ, he could, because his being willing would be a receiving, and that if he inclined to love God, he could, because his inclining is loving. And yet it may be also truly said that man can't do those things without the addition of new principles, 
is that he cannot do them while in a natural state. Number three, a man can perform no act at all without God. In strictness, we can do nothing of ourselves. As we have not derived our being of ourselves, and neither are we capable of acting of ourselves, but are immediately dependent on God every moment to enable us to perform any act at all. We can do nothing without the influx and concurrence of the divine power. Without this, we can't eat or work, or walk, or breathe, or stand, or sit. God must uphold man and being. And not only so, but it is God that upholds a life and upholds a power of action. And a power can't be put into act in any one thing without divine influx. Acts 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. In God's hand our breath is, and his are all our ways. Daniel 5, verse 23. But yet, number 4. There are many things that may be properly said to be in a man's power because he can do them without either new faculties or new principles. There are some things that can't be said to be in a man's power because they are beyond his faculties, and there are other things that can't be said properly to be in the power of a natural man because they are beyond his principles. But there are other things that are neither beyond his faculties nor principles, and those are said properly to be in a man's own power, or in the power of a natural man. For though he can't do them without divine assistance, as he can do nothing at all without God, yet he can do them with no more than common assistance, with no more than that concurrence or influx, in which God is present with every creature that he has made according to the natures that he has given them. And it is in man's power that has a use of reason and a perfect and sound body to walk or speak. He can't do it without God. Yet there is such an assistance universally granted to man that upon proper endeavors used in proper circumstances, the effect ever follows. Thus it is with all natural actions. They are what are properly in a man's power. By natural actions, I mean those actions that nature is sufficient for. Nature consists in the faculties of nature and principles of nature, but both are sufficient for this kind of actions. Number five. There are many of those things that are to be done in order to his salvation that are thus in a man's power. There are many such things that are needful to be done in order to his salvation, and which, if they were done, would tend to promote it. There are many of those things that are to be done in order to a man's salvation that are as much in a man's power as it is in his power to do anything in a secular business. They are as much natural actions as man's ordinary actions about worldly things. They are what will as certainly follow your proper endeavors being used. In other human actions, if a man doesn't endeavor them, he won't do them. But there are many things that are to be done in order to a man's salvation, which if a man does but do his endeavors, they'll be done. If there are things of this kind that I intended in the doctrine, when I say that persons ought to do what they can for their salvation... Secondly, I proceed, therefore, in the second place, to mention some things that a man can do in order to his salvation, and that are in his power, in a sense explained. Number one, a man can abstain from the outward gratification of his lusts. The inclinations and principles of the heart may not be in his power, but his outward behavior in which the ordinary motions and acts of the body are concerned, they are in a man's power. A man may not be able to help the being of a lust in his heart, and may not be able to hinder the internal motions of it so, but that it will exercise itself in some measure, but yet he can avoid the outward gratifications of it. Thus persons can avoid the outward gratification of his envy or revenge. If a man finds in himself a revengeful disposition, he finds in him ill will against some of his neighbor for some injury is received from him. It is in his power whether or not he will do anything to revenge himself on that man or not. If he sees an opportunity that he could do his neighbor a displeasure, it is in his own breast a thing in which he is at liberty whether he will put forth his hand and do it, or whether he will withhold his hand. 
He is under no necessity of nature to make use of his hands to this or that purpose. His hands are at the command of his will, so he can avoid showing ill will against him by talking against him. He can avoid saying anything to slur his character or wound his reputation. He can choose whether he will use his tongue to this purpose or not. The organs of speech, they are obedient to the commands of the will. So man can avoid outwardly manifesting a spirit of envy. He can avoid doing anything to lessen the honor or prosperity of him that is God above him. So a man can, if he will, avoid any way defrauding or wronging his neighbor in his dealings. So though a man has in him much of the lust of covetousness, yet he can avoid gratifying of it by wronging others for his own interest. So he can avoid inclining after the world in any inordinate manner. Persons can avoid the outward gratifying of those lusts that are very strong and violent. He can abstain from those things that he has a strong inclination to. That a man has a violent inclination of such or such a practice, or is set upon it, is no argument that he can't avoid it, but only that he won't avoid it. A man that has a strong appetite to strong drink, he can avoid going to a tavern, if he will. He can avoid putting a cup to his mouth. That is no impossibility in those things that aren't beyond the power of nature. There can be nothing wanting in order to a man's avoiding such things, but only that he should be willing. So a person can avoid the gratifying of an unclean lust. He can avoid unclean acts. The hands and feet and eyes and tongue, they are in all human acts at the command of the will. A man uses them to this or that purpose or not as he pleases. All those actions of man that are outward or are done by the voluntary motions or actions of the body, they are wholly natural actions, and therefore must be wholly in a man's power. Number two, it is in man's power to reform any vicious course or practice thoroughly and to reform. A man can, in many respects, keep out of the way of temptation. If he finds that any particular calling or business proves a snare to him, and that it is often a reason of his falling into sin, he can forsake it. If he finds that any particular way of living is attended with great and frequent temptations, he can avoid it. Or if he finds that any place or company is a snare to him, he can avoid them. A person can, if he will, forsake evil company, though it will be great self-denial in him so to do. It is no argument that he can't do it. A person can keep out of the way of tempting objects. He may avoid going to extremes of what is in itself lawful when he finds it is a temptation to him to go beyond the due limits. Number three. Persons can perform outward duties of morality towards their neighbor. A person can use all proper and due care to pay his debts. They can do all that is required of them to do in order to their rendering everyone his due. They can give to everyone that outward honor and respect that is his due. They can give everyone their due respect in their several stations and relations. It is in a person's power to give what they ought to give to their neighbor and want. They can be liberal and open-handed and fully come up to the rule of the gospel to what is outward in acts of charity and mutual kindness and helpfulness. They can do good to those that hate them and despitefully use them. Number four. Persons can search the scriptures. Persons have it as much in their power to read the Bible as to read a song or story. It is no more out of a man's power to see and put together the letters or syllables written in the Bible than those that are written on any other paper. And they can attend to what they read. They can take notice of it. They can take notice of the doctrines that are taught in the Word of God and the duties that are there required and the sins there forbidden. They can take notice what threatenings that are there for sin and what promises to obedience. They can take notice what accounts there are of judgments that God has executed for sin and manifestations of his wrath against ungodly men. They can take notice what mercies he has bestowed on his people and what rewards he has given to obedience. They can use proper endeavors to understand the Bible, can take notice of the drift and design of it. They can pry into it. Number five. Persons can attend all the ordinances. They can outwardly keep the Sabbath day in a strict manner, spending the time in exercises of religion. They can go 
to the church meetings. They can give attention and go along with the public prayer. They can give attention to what the Word of God says when it is preached. They can take good notice of what is said. They can take notice of what is suitable for their case, keeping from gazing about, keep from sleeping. And they can attend all their ordinances of religion. Number six. Persons can use their tongues to the purpose of religion. They are under no necessity to use these only in vain conversation. They can tell of the things of religion. They can ask advice about the great affairs of their precious souls. Number seven. Persons have in a great measure the command of their thoughts. We don't wholly have the command of our thoughts by nature, but we have in a great measure. We have that power that we can take off our thoughts from one object and fix them on another. Persons have that power that they can avoid dwelling in their thoughts and ruminating on sinful objects. When their imaginations get upon such objects, they can break them off and turn them to something else more suitable for them to think of. They can avoid indulging and feeding their lust and unlawful appetites in their imagination. They can refuse to take the pleasure of sinful gratifications and fixed, continuous thoughts. And when they get upon them unawares, they are able to check and restrain them. A man can avoid dwelling on worldly things on Sabbath days. He can recall his thoughts when wandering in time of divine worship. A man that has that power of his thoughts that he can meditate on divine things. When ministers exhort people to consider their latter end, to consider the eternity that is before them, and how dreadful eternal misery is, and to lay themselves frequently on their deathbeds in their thoughts, and place themselves before the judgment seat of God, they don't exhort them to what they can't do. Persons can call off their thoughts from worldly objects, and can set themselves from time to time to think of death, judgment, and eternity. They can often get alone out of the way of the noise and business of the world and converse with their own hearts and think of their sins and the aggravations of them as of their own danger and misery and need of an interest in Christ. Though it may be hard to keep their thoughts fixed long on these subjects, yet they are what we can think of if we will, and though they may often wander, yet we can recall them. Some have more the commands of their thoughts than others, yet all have, in a degree, power over their own thoughts. Number eight. Persons can set apart a suitable proportion of their time for these things. They are able to spend as much time in reading the scriptures as they ought, and they are able to spend as much time in the duties of prayer and solemn meditation as are required of them. Number nine. Persons can improve divine assistance that is given. If God is striving by His Spirit, they can observe His motions and influences and fall in with them. When impressions are made by word or providence, they can take heed not to rest them out. They are able to avoid what shall divert their minds. They can do what shall tend to continue it and promote it. They can take heed not to quench the Spirit or grieve in it by any sin. There is such and such as cherishing the motions and influences of the Spirit of God that persons are naturally capable of. And lastly, they can lay out their strength in these things as well as other things. He can do it with his utmost endeavors. He can attend to the scriptures, that he read and search it and pry into it and apply it to himself with great diligence. He can with very great diligence attend to the word preach and labor with great diligence to keep his mind from wandering in times of divine worship. He can use great diligence in watching against sin and temptations and striving against his corruption. He can use great diligence in prayer to God. There is much room for a man to lay out the strength of his soul and exert the utmost of his faculties in all these things as well as other things, as well as in contriving how to get the world as well as in managing any secular business. All these things and others that might be mentioned, persons can do. They are properly in their power as much as it is in a man's power to work or attend his secular business. For all these things do consist in natural actions as much as those things that are wholly terminated in worldly things. Before I proceed to the reasons, I would take notice of several objections that may be made against what has been said under this second head, wherein I have showed what things persons can do in order to their salvation. 
Objection number one. Some may object and say, Are we not often taught that wicked men are absolutely under the power and dominion of sin and are slaves to their lusts? We are taught that wicked men are sold under sin, that they are the devil's captives and perfect slaves to sin. How then can it be said to be in a man's power to avoid the gratification of his lusts? If he be at liberty to gratify his lusts or not, to gratify them as he pleases, how then can it be said that he is under the absolute dominion of his lusts and perfectly enslaved? Answer number one. The dominion of sin doesn't consist in forcing men to gratify their lust against their wills, but in making men willing. A man is not under the dominion of sin by being unable to help gratifying his lust when he wills and endeavors it, but by the influence that sin has upon the will and endeavors for self. That a man is absolutely under the dominion of sin doesn't in the least argue that a man can't avoid the outward gratification of such a lust. Let him desire it and try never so much. Sin has not its dominion that way, but by the influence it has directly in the will itself. As for instance, when a man that is under the dominion of the lust of drunkenness, that lust doesn't deprive him of the power of acting his own pleasure, and it doesn't cause but that he can follow his own inclinations and do as he pleases as well as other men. His lust doesn't deprive him of that natural power of moving his hands according to his own pleasure as well as other men. It doesn't force his hands to take strong liquor and put it to his mouth when his will commands the contrary. And when all the while he desires and wishes and endeavors to let it alone and hates to meddle, but his lust has dominion over him by the influence it has upon his will to make him willing to take it. The way that sin has possession of a man in dominion is by having the possession of the heart, so that men aren't inclined to any other than sin. It has the dominion over their affections and choice, so that it makes them love sin and choose it and will it and endeavor, and not that it makes them commit outward acts of sin, though they truly endeavor the contrary. If once sin should lose its dominion over the will, it would lose its dominion over the man. The dominion of grace consists primarily in the power it has in the will. Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in a day of thy power. So it is with sin. Number 2. Natural men, and that they are under the dominion of sin, can do no other than sin. But that doesn't argue that they can't avoid particular outward acts and ways of sin. He can't avoid sin in the general he can't avoid sins of the heart, such as enmity against God and unbelief, pride, carnality, which are the great principles of all sin. He can't without new principles avoid the prevailing of those. He can't avoid the inward exercise of those unless his heart be changed. Neither can he avoid sin in the general, in his outward behavior, because there is sin in everything that a man does. And so he is under the dominion of sin. But yet, there are particular ways of sin that a natural man can avoid. There are particular ways of sin that many natural men do avoid, though they are all under the dominion of sin. There are many natural men that do avoid a way of drunkenness. There are many that do avoid a way of fornication. So that a man's being under the dominion of sin doesn't at all argue that it is not in his power to avoid the outward gratifications of carnal appetites. Though a natural man can't avoid the exercise of unbelief and an inordinate self-love and such primary principles of sin, yet he can avoid the outward gratification of particular lusts so as to live outwardly a blameless and inoffensive life. Number three, slavery to sin doesn't appear in a man's being forced to sin against his will, but in being made to do what conscience and right reason declare will be for his own hurt. Men, by being enslaved to sin, do what is for their own misery. They undo themselves, but yet they don't sin against their wills. Therefore, the wise man says, they love death. Proverbs 8.36 And God tells men that he sets before them life and death and blessing and cursing that they may choose. Deuteronomy 30 verses 15 and verse 19. 
Men are such slaves to sin that they are hurried on to do things against their conscience and sometimes against great convictions of conscience. Their conscience tells them that they dreadfully expose themselves by it. But yet they aren't forced, but when they commit knowing outward acts of sin, they choose to commit it. A third objection may be from that place of the Apostle in Romans 7, verse 19, For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Answer. This is true of the inward exercises and motions of sin in the heart. But these are not the things that I am speaking. These are not what I assent to be in a man's power. It is not in a man's power to prevent the exercises of corruption, though he may do much towards restraining them, yet he can't wholly prevent them. But what we are speaking of is the outward gratifications of men's lusts and carnal appetites. It may not be in a man's power to prevent some stirrings of an ill spirit towards his enemy, but it is in his power whether he will outwardly revenge himself upon him or not. Every Christian finds cause to say, as the Apostle did, the things that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do, and that when they would do good, when they would pray to God and serve Him in the exercise of grace, and so as to glorify Him, then evil is present with them, then there arises corruption, worldliness, and pride, and many evil things will put forth themselves, such things as these, it is not in the power to prevent, though they may do much to check and restrain them. It seems to be especially those things the Apostle has respect to. The Apostle found a body of death within him that made him say as he does, and makes him cry out as he does in the 24th verse, O wretched man that I am, I hate that I do. When the Apostle says the evil that I would not that I do, he speaks of something that he found in himself from time to time, but the Apostle doesn't mean that he from time to time, against his will, gratified his lusts and carnal appetites in the outward acts. But it was the inward workings of corruption that was the evil that was present with him when he would do good. Number two, when the Apostle says, when I would do good, evil is present with me, he may be understood that this is a will or inclination of a spiritual part. The Apostle seemed to have respect chiefly to the inward exercises of corruption, but it may be sometimes true in a sense of Christians as to outward actions that the evil that they would not, that they do. But then it is to be understood the evil that they would not, when they are themselves, the evil that they would not as saints, not as men, that is, it is against the will of the spiritual part. The Apostle is here setting forth how that Christians have two opposite principles, flesh and spirit the law of the members and the law of the mind, that are opposite one to another. The will of the flesh is contrary to the will of the Spirit, as Christ says in Matthew 26, verse 41. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Apostle says here in this context that he delights in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Romans 7, verses 22 and 23. So that if we extend the Apostle's words to outward actions, the meaning must be that he did evil when it was contrary to the will of his spirit, or contrary to that will or desire of the law of his mind, and the context plainly lends to this interpretation. Objection number four, and last. How can it be said that it is in man's own power to do all those things for their salvation when we are often told that men never will be thorough in the use of means unless God awakens them? It has been asserted that it is in man's own power thoroughly to reform their sins and carefully to avoid and watch against temptation, and that they can search the scriptures and diligently attend all ordinances and meditate on divine things, and can spend a suitable proportion of time in these things and lay out their strength in them can be violent in them. But if this be true, why is it said that there is a necessity of awakening in order to persons doing these things, and that they will never be thorough without awakening? And awakenings are from God, and we haven't them in our own power. Answer. That persons never are willing to do these things without awakenings doesn't argue that they can't. 
The persons never do these things without awakening shows the necessity of awakenings to make men willing, but it doesn't show the necessity of awakenings in order to give it power. Giving will and giving power are different. A man may have it in his power to do a thing that he never is willing to do. It is very ill arguing from the defect of the will to the defect of power. That a lazy person never is willing to work doesn't argue that he is not able to work. Men are opposite to strive for their salvation. They love that sloth and stupidity and are so taken up with care and concern about other things that there is a necessity of awakening to make them willing to strive for their salvation, but no necessity at all in order to give them power. I have insisted the longer upon these objections because persons are apt to flatter themselves oftentimes that they can't reform their sins. They have it in their power unless God assists them, and so cast all the blame upon God and quiet their own consciences with this excuse. They vainly flatter themselves that their lusts are so strong that they can't restrain themselves, and so seem to look upon themselves in a great measure excusable for going on in their wickedness. So they will excuse themselves for their idleness and neglecting their salvation, that they don't take no more care and are not any more thorough. They say they can do nothing. They can't strive of themselves. They can't strive unless God awakens them. And so they seem to lay the fault of their unreasonable, vile sloth and negligence on God as though it was all owing to Him. It is true they can't strive for salvation of themselves. No, none can work of themselves. But they have it as much in their power to strive for salvation as they have to strive for an estate. Section 3 I proceed now in the next place to the reasons why persons ought to do what they can for their salvation. Number one, because salvation is of so much value that it is worth a while for a man to do what he can for it. Salvation is so great a thing, so glorious an attainment, that it is worth a while for a man to do his utmost every day during his whole life in the use of all proper means that he may attain. It is true, as this would be a laborious life, sinners are ready to object against it and to think it much for them to lay out themselves and do their utmost that they are able in every duty for any long time, especially for their whole lifetime, continually to maintain such a strict watch over themselves, and to maintain a constant strife with their strongest inclinations, and to deny every one of their lusts, and at all times abstain from gratifying of them at all, these are difficult things." and that they must from day to day lay out their strength in a continual application to duties of religion and appointed means of grace, that they should strive continually in prayer and strive in reading and searching the scriptures and strive in watching over their thoughts and restraining wicked and unsuitable ones, that they should strive in keeping the Sabbath in public and private and strive in meditating of the great things of religion and strive in attending to public duties, strive in hearing and improving the word, and strive in all branches of their duty to their neighbor, and strive against their sloth, and against all their corruptions, and against all temptations, seems difficult for them. It is indeed a very painful and laborious life, and looks to men to be a very tiresome, uncomfortable sort of living. It looks to them like a burden too big for any man to be willing to submit to. They could do so for a little while, but it looks too much to spend their whole life doing so. But indeed, it is well worth a while to do. It is for salvation. It is well worth a while to comply with all these things for so great an attainment. Salvation is so great a blessing that it will richly pay for it. If ever persons obtain salvation, they won't repent it. Though they have spent their whole lives in such a course, they'll see that they are richly paid and that all their pain is nothing compared with such an attainment. If ever they obtain salvation, they will in all probability be richly paid by the comfort they'll have of it in this world. How much more when they come to enjoy the happiness of heaven? How little a time in heaven will pay for all? How is life valued by men? How much will men do for life? But how valuable indeed, then, is eternal life? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. A second reason why men should do what they can for their salvation is because salvation is of such necessity. 
Many other things are accounted things of great value, but that they aren't things of absolute necessity. An earthly kingdom is looked upon as a thing of great worth, but it is not a thing of necessity that men may do. They can live and live comfortably without it. Human learning is a thing of great worth, but it is not of absolute necessity. But salvation is not only a thing infinitely valuable, but is of infinite necessity. There is nothing that we are the like necessity of, and indeed there is nothing that we are in absolute necessity of, but this. We have no absolute necessity of food or clothing or the preservation of our temporal life. We may be without these things and yet not be undone. But it is not so with salvation. This we are in absolute necessity of. None can utter how great necessity we stand in of the salvation of our souls. And therefore, we should do what we can for it. Sinners are ready to object against the toilsomeness and disagreeableness of such a way if they should comply with it. They must take so much pains. They must cross themselves so much. They must lose so much and undergo so much. How can they bear to deny, forever to deny and cast off such a lust that is so sweet to them and that they love so well? How can they bear to deny themselves those enjoyments that others, their neighbors and companions, take? And if they should comply with this direction, they don't see how they shall have any more comfort of their lives. But what is all this to the purpose as long as salvation is a thing that must be obtained? What signifies it to talk of the ways being cross and unpleasant as long as we must have salvation? It won't do to perish to all eternity. There is no such thing as grappling with eternal damnation. We must do what is requisite in order to escape this. Who can think of being tormented forever in body and soul under the unmixed and unrestrained wrath of enraged omnipotence? There is no man alive that can support himself under such a thought or that can subsist under such an expectation. There is no consideration that will balance this. There is nothing that will do to put into scales with eternal damnation. That one consideration that it is eternal swallows up all at once. It makes all things nothing to it. Matthew 16, verse 26. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Matthew 26, 24. Good had it been for that man if he had not been born. Reason number three. That salvation is to be obtained in the way of the use of means. The power of God is sufficient to do it without any means at all, and when means are used there is no natural efficacy in them. It is not in means. We are not able to obtain salvation by our own endeavors. But yet this is the appointed way for men to obtain salvation. Though it is God that immediately bestows a blessing, yet it is a will of God to prepare a man for this blessing in this way. Salvation is a thing that God has appointed us to strive for, that we may show our value of it and our sense of the importance of it this way. It is a command of God that we strive to enter in at the straight gate, and that we seek salvation with all our might, that we do whatever lies in our power, Proverbs 2, verses 2 to 4, incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding, Cry after knowledge, lift up thy voice for understanding. Seek her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures. Though we can't save ourselves by our own strength, yet salvation is a prize which God has set up for us to run for. Therefore, seeing the prize is so great and is a thing so absolutely necessary, we shall lay out ourselves to our utmost that we may overcome in this race, that so we may win the prize. Number four. We ought to do all we can for our salvation, because the obtaining it is attended with many impediments and obstacles that but very few do obtain. The greater part of the world doesn't enjoy the revelation of a salvation to be obtained. But when I say but few obtain, I mean but few of those that do know of it and would obtain it. There are so many things in the way that few surmount them. Those that never made trial may think that it is an easy thing to be saved, but others find innumerable difficulties in the way. 
There's such opposition from a dull, sluggish, carnal, proud, self-righteous heart, and opposition from the powers of darkness and such snares and worldly things, in worldly enjoyments and worldly afflictions, in all worldly circumstances. And of the men of the world, those there are but few that conquer, but few that get over those mountains. They all desire to come to the pleasant land of safety and happiness that is beyond them, but so high and great are the mountains that far the greater part remain and perish on this side of them. How few will take the pains that is needful to surmount them. Many attempt it and go up the hill a little way and find it so difficult that they grow discouraged and go down again. Some are inconstant, and as much as they go up at one time, they go down at another. And so in a general come no near to salvation. How few are they that lay out themselves in that earnest and laborious manner, and with that constancy and perseverance is to get over these mountains. When we therefore see so many fail in this attempt and perish, and never obtain, so many of all sorts and degrees, and so few, so very few that succeed, surely we ought to do our utmost. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Matthew 7, verse 14, Luke 13, verse 24. Many there be that seek, that shall not be able to enter in. Number 5. We ought to do what we can for our salvation, because the time will soon come, and we know not how soon, when we never can do anything any more towards our salvation. The time will soon come that we can never do anything more, that shall have any such tendency, or can in any wise promote this end. Now if we have the wisdom to consult our own happiness, we may do many things that will have this tendency. Now we can devise things that shall give us great advantage for this. Now we know many things that we may do for help in this, but the time is coming when there will be no more work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Ecclesiastes 9.10 and his time will soon come, it is an appointed, limited time. And we know not how short it is. God has turned up our glass, and all that we can do towards our own salvation is while that glass is running. And we know not how short a glass it may be. It may be, it has come now to some of the lost souls already. John 9 verse 4, I must work while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Application number one. Let this doctrine put those that are seeking their salvation upon examining themselves, whether or not they are in a way of doing what they can. There are many kinds of seekers. There are some that are wholly negligent of the concern of their souls and are going on in ways of sin. They yet may be said to seek salvation. They have a kind of belief or at least a suspicion that there is a heaven and a hell and they intend to have their sins pardoned and have their peace made with God before they die, and are doing something for it, though it be but in a poor, slight manner. Let each one that is seeking that he may be saved inquire how it is with him. Ye have heard what reason there is that persons should do whatever lies in their power that they may be saved. Are ye seeking salvation in such a way? I don't inquire here whether or not you do those duties that are not in your power or that you can't do without more than common assistance, but whether or not you do those things that are in your power, the power of a natural man to do with but common assistance, whether you do those things that natural power and principles are sufficient for and that you are really as able to do as you are to work or follow your ordinary business. My inquiry now is not what you experience, whether you have great terrors or extraordinary impressions made upon your mind, but what you do. I don't now inquire what God does for you in that in which you are only passive, but my inquiry is about your part, what you do yourself, and that which you can do of your own natural power. Are you thorough in doing this part? Objection. Here it may be, some may be ready to object and say that this is not to be expected because there never anyone did do what they could for their salvation. I answer, my inquiry is not whether you do what you can in every single act, but whether or not you are in a way of doing what you can, whether you are in such a way in the general or whether you are not in a way of neglecting doing what you can. A person may be in a way of doing what he can or may not be in a way of neglecting anything that he can do and yet may not do what he can in every single act. At some time, he may not be so watchful as he might be over his own heart. He may not exert his utmost in every prayer and every petition. 
He may sometimes fail of doing what he might do to resist his sloth and his worldliness. It can't be said that he does his utmost every moment or hour, and yet it may be truly said that he is not in a way of neglecting anything that he can do. But in the general he may be said to be thorough in this work of seeking salvation, and that he strives in good earnest and lays out himself to his utmost. Therefore, what I now put to you is not whether, when you look back, you can see that you have failed of doing your utmost in some particular acts, whether you never have any times wherein a listless, negligent spirit in a measure prevails, not that persons are excusable for not doing what they can towards the performance of their duty in any one act or every moment, and every moment that they are not makes them inexcusable before God. But this is not what I intend here, but that which I now propose to your self-examination is whether or not your general way and course is a way of doing your utmost for your salvation, whether or not this be your steady and sincere aim to be doing the utmost that is in your power that you may be saved. Every one that fails of this, he fails of being thorough in the work, and he so far may be said to be negligent in the way of seeking. A man that is not brought to this so far fails of being sincere and in good earnest in that inquiry, what shall I do to be saved? Because at the same time that he asks what he shall do, he is not willing to do everything that he shall be directed to do. He asks a question with a kind of reserve. When a person makes this inquiry, what shall I do to be saved? There is a pretense in it of being willing to do anything that they shall be directed to that that they can. And therefore, if they are not willing... They are not in earnest in the inquiry, because they ask for direction without a preparedness to follow the direction when it shall be given. When the Apostle Paul in the ninth of Acts, in the sixth verse, cries out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? As he was in earnest in that inquiry, it showed that he was willing to do anything that lay in his power. He does, as it were, to give Christ a blank that he may write what terms he pleases. So when the jailer in Acts 16, verse 30, called for a light, and sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, saying, What shall I do to be saved? It shows that he was willing to do anything, and everything that lay in his power. Inquire more particularly, number one, whether or not there be no lust whatsoever that is your manner, and in some degree, voluntarily, to gratify there are many lusts, many ill dispositions in the heart. Consider them particularly and examine yourself as to all of them, whether or not it is not your way and manner to gratify them in some degree in some voluntary act or other, some way in your outward actions and behavior or in your thoughts and imaginations. All voluntary actions are in your power, whether they be outward in those that the organs of the body are used in or whether they be only in thoughts. And if it be your manner to gratify some lust and some such voluntary act, though it be but in a little degree, you aren't in a way of doing what you can for your salvation. As for example, if it be your way to gratify your envy or ill spirit against any of your neighbors, though it be in doing no more than speaking of his real faults from such a spirit and with a desire to diminish his good name, or if you gratify your hatred of your neighbor in any way, indirectly furthering anything that shall be to his disadvantage, or only in aiming that he may be crossed and not suited. If it be you do thus from a spirit against him, herein you fell of doing what you can for your own salvation. So if it be your manner to gratify some inordinate sensual appetite in, only now and then taking the pleasure of thinking of the object of your lust, herein you fell of doing what you can and what you must for your salvation. Number two. Inquire whether or not there be no one duty that you are in some degree allowedly negligent of. Is there no duty of God's worship that you neglect? Is there no appointed means that you are negligent of? Do you read the Bible so much as you ought to do? Do you take those pains to search the scriptures and understand it and profit by it as you ought to do? What about prayer? Is it your manner to give attention to the word? And is it indeed your sincere aim and endeavor to attend to it all, or is it your manner to let some of it go while you sleep? We may determine of the bulk of those that are sleepers at the church meeting that they are not in a way of doing what they can for their salvation. Is there no duty of justice and equity towards your neighbor that you neglect? Do you do your duty towards your children, take those pains you ought 
Don't you live in some degree of negligence of duties of charity? Do you do as much at communicating to the supply of others' needs as you ought, so far as you can judge of the rules of the gospel in that matter? Do you do what you ought so far as you are able to judge of your duty at inquiring the way to Zion or asking advice and counsel of proper persons concerning the affair of your salvation? Do you set yourself to consider the great things of another world, the shortness of time, death, judgment, heaven and hell, your sins, your need of a savior? Do you perform those duties as often as you can, judge, they are required? Do you allot a sufficient part of your time to be spent on them? Do you watch over your own heart to prevent your falling into sin? And is it your manner to do those things with your utmost endeavor, to lay out your strength in them and keep diligent watch that you may keep down corruption and that you may do your duty? If you attend all the duties mentioned, yet if you perform them in a negligent manner and not with diligent and vigorous endeavors, you are not in the way of doing what you can. You are under no necessity of giving way to a dull, slothful spirit. Some persons deceive themselves. They flatter themselves that they do what they can for their salvation, though they are far from being thorough in seeking of it. Some men will make this excuse for their not being converted, that they cannot convert themselves, that they have done what they could, that they might be converted, and so wipe themselves clear of all blame in this manner, when indeed they have been far from doing what they could. They have all the while been dreadfully taken up with the pursuit of the world, have minded the world a great deal more than seeking salvation, and have lived in a way of gratifying many ill dispositions in one degree or the other. They don't consider what they can do, nor what they would do if God should but make them willing by thorough awakening. Some say they have done what they could. They can do no more unless God should awaken them, when the truth is they aren't willing to do more without further awakening. They don't need awakening to make them able, but only to make them willing. Number two. A use of conviction to convince sinners that God may justly deny them salvation and that they haven't done what was in their own power to do for their salvation. Men are very apt to justify themselves and cast the blame of their own misery off from themselves. When sinners are in some measure sensible what a miserable condition they are in out of Christ and are under terrifying apprehensions of damnation, it is a hard thing for them to own that this, their misery and danger, is owing to themselves, and that the blame of it wholly belongs to them. It is common for them to clear themselves with that, that they can't convert themselves. That which is required to their salvation is a thing out of their power. It is God's work, and not man's. They therefore don't see how they are chargeable with it. If they are told what a monstrous folly it is not to take heaven when it is offered, and to run and plunge themselves headlong into hell, they don't see that they are chargeable for it. They say, we can't convert ourselves. But what does this signify? Whether you can convert yourselves or not, how can that be any excuse when you haven't done that which you might have done that you might be converted? Though men can't convert themselves, yet you are directed and advised by God to seek conversion and are told in what way you should seek it and you are directed to do those things in order to it that are in your power and you haven't done those things. Here all excuse is wholly cut off, and you are left inexcusable. What can you have to answer when it shall be demanded why you haven't done these, and those things that God commanded you to do for your salvation, that you had as much in your power as these, and those things that you have done for your worldly profit or advancement or pleasure? You are like the slothful servant mentioned in the 25th chapter of Matthew, the 24th and 25th verses, who came when he was called to an account, and said to his Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in his napkin. His excuse was the excuse that wicked men commonly make, namely that his master was hard to his servant, and expected more profit and gain of his servants than he had given ability and advantage for, more usury and interest than the talents that he had given would produce. But that was no excuse for not improving the talent that he had for the doing of th that he could do, making that gain that his master had given him wherewithal to make. But as his master tells him, he is condemned out of his own mouth, 
seeing that he owns himself sensible that his master would exact gain of him, and as he pretends, even with rigor, he ought to have done what he could. He ought to have improved the talent that he had, so that if he was such an hard man as to reap where he had not sown, doubtless he would expect to reap where he had sown. So whether Christ had given you power to convert yourself or not, yet doubtless you are altogether inexcusable for not doing that for your conversion that is in your power to do. Here is sufficient in this one consideration forever to stop the mouths of all unconverted persons and to show that God might justly forever deny them mercy. Whereas one natural person that can say that he has done what he could for his salvation whereas one who can't accuse himself of woeful negligence of his precious soul. If you do what you can now, yet you have not done what you might have done in times past, and your past negligence renders you inexcusable. God directs and commands men to do their utmost for their salvation at all times. Their whole time is given them for this purpose, that they may therein seek and make sure of happiness in their eternal state. And you're doing what you can now, if you do so, doesn't excuse you for your negligence in times past. God might justly deny you salvation for your willful neglect of it in times past. If you had not done what you could for your salvation, though it were only for a little while, that would render you without excuse. But can you clear yourself of having been greatly negligent in this matter? Yea, you have not only not done what you could for your salvation, but you have done many things that you might have avoided against your salvation. You have done innumerable things in which you have laid blocks in the way of your own salvation, that you were under no necessity of doing, and that you were warned against and told how much they tended to hinder your salvation. If you had done what you could for your salvation, in all probability you might have been converted long ago, so that you should cease to lay the blame of your not being converted on God, and should take it to yourself. Being sensible that God will be altogether just and righteous if he should forever refuse to give you his converting grace. End of sermon. Persons ought to do what they can for their salvation. Jonathan Edwards